Welcome. My name is Celine Figueroa, and I am a program specialist at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I am so excited for you all to join us in this three-part series. We've got three date nights that we're really, really looking forward to, and this is the first of many that is called Scent Sciences. Now, Scent Sciences is um, has a lot of fun stuff for tonight. So we're, we've got cocktails from our very own Patrick from the museum. We have the Nose Nose presented by Tiffany where we'll explore why it is that you actually associate certain smells with certain seasons and memories. Then we have Scent Composition, which we are so excited. It's a very interesting video. Then Smelly Science, where yours truly will uh, lead you all on a trivia journey to what it is that uh, what some fun science smelly facts. I don't know how better to describe that. And finally, space smells from Naomi. If we have time, we'll do a fun activity at the very, very end. Um, a quick update on that poll. Let me see if I can pull it up for everybody. Apple cinnamon has the lead with 56% of everything. Um, followed by pumpkin spice, then something else, autumn leaves were a big one in the comments, and then bonfire. Um, but bonfire seems to be popular as well in the comments, so that's very interesting. I'm going to light my candle and introduce our very own Patrick. Um, Patrick, it looks like you are muted. There you go. Our very own Patrick, who's going to lead us in cocktail making. Tonight we've got mulled wine. I'm lighting my candle, as you all can see. It's not cooperating. Okay. Well. Awesome. All right. Patrick? Hi. How is everyone? I'm here to give you a little bit of history about mulled wine and just to make a, a quick um, uh, sample of one tonight. And then I've got this fun little uh, vessel we're going to put it into to if you're going to have a celebration with maybe a few few close friends that don't have COVID um, <laughs> this will be fun to do okay so <clears throat> you can get the recipe and I'm just going to add that I have everything measured out um, you know little fun fact mulled wine uh, it comes from about the second century there's writings in um, some Roman scripts that talk about spiced wine, and that's exactly what it is, spiced wine. So in here I have cinnamon, I have nutmeg. You can use powdered or grate it at the end. Sometimes you could grate like just the top uh, on the, on after the drink is made. Uh, here's my black peppercorns. All spice, very interesting because this is a new world spice. How did it get to this ancient European drink? Maybe someone could come up with that answer later. <laughs> and then three whole cloves. And then I, I'm using fennel seed, but you can use anise seed. Um, you can also use uh, a few um, star anise, but uh, this will give a, a, lighter, um, a lighter licorice flavor. Star anise will give you that powerful pungent, a little too much. Um, normally, I would throw this on the stove at a low heat and bring up some of the essential oils, right? Just, just so they start to smoke and, and then um, throw in my sugar and a bottle of uh, Merlot. So a fruity wine, a little trick, get it all out of there. And a cup of uh, brandy. I just use a cooking brandy, but you can use an expensive brandy and it would taste all that much better. Uh, Palmason does a fine job, I'm sure. Okay, and then I have my citrus. I have a half of a lemon sliced and then a half of an orange also sliced. Very good orange. I eat the other half. <laughs> it's delicious. Now, we're just going to put this on the stove for about 10 minutes. And I let it steep also after that um, for, you know, at least 15 or 20 more minutes. And it all depends on how much of that spice scent you really want. Our house smells like um, 
fall right now. So <laughs> it smells really good. Uh, Pumpkin so, to prove it. I know there's no, someone will develop one one day. Smells online. So put this on the stove. And I'm gonna take off the one I made before, pour it into our, our pot here. Now, you can do two things, and I would have liked to have done this just now, but uh, you can strain it before it goes in or strain it per glass. Um, but the glasses are, are kind of fun. They're, they're decorated. I decorated some beakers with uh, some cinnamon, orange, and some star anise. And uh, a couple, another thing I'm going to do here, <clears throat> because it's all about presentation, right? And, and science. <laughs> Can you hear that? It is a beautiful noise. Oh. Like Tamara's joining us, I, uh, and their beverage of choice is water chilled. There we go. So I put the lid back on. Now you could have some uh, some waterproof lights in there, but if you see now all that smoke is starting to pour out of my pumpkin's eyes and nose, and it looks like it's on fire. So here we go. Nice warm drink. For this time of year, it's perfect. And I use canela cinnamon um, instead of regular cinnamon, but you can use it any kind you like, but this is kind of traditional Mexican cinnamon. Oh God, yeah, it's so good. You gotta try this recipe. Have fun with the little pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I My beverage tonight is just tea. We're still on the clock here. Um, yeah. So I'm drinking some throat coat tea which has a little bit of licorice in it. So I think it's basically the same. This actually has a little bit of a throat coating uh, capability as well. <laughs> wow. Um, well, Patrick is gonna stay on for anybody that has any questions. It looks like some folks in the chat um, are drinking various beverages from water to Pinot Noir to peach mango blonde ale. Oh, that sounds good. It also sounds a little fall. I don't know, I, I associate ciders and beers with fall. And the peach, it always reminds me of going into the fall, chilly season. Being a chef is uh, it's exciting. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, if you all have any questions for Patrick, go ahead and type those in to the chat. He'll stay on for just uh, a little bit longer. Thank you so much, Patrick. Right. I am excited to try this recipe out. Me too. Thanks. And... <laughs> It looks like Liz is on uh, her third bottle of wine, but is wishing that it was mold wine. So um, there's always room for improvement is my motto. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Up next, let me go ahead and pull up my notes here. Um, so you all do have that recipe on um, in the chat. I believe it was also emailed to you before the show. So if you don't get to make it right now, it's okay. You know, can, there's never a bad time for mold wine. Um, up next, we have a very exciting um, video presented by Tiffany Nessel. Um, so Tiffany, there it is, is the research manager um, of the genetics lab here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where we conduct taste and flavor investigations. She trains community scientists, that's anybody who volunteers who may or may not have a science background on how to conduct all aspects of taste research. Tonight, we are diving into the titular question, what does the nose know? So I'm going to go ahead and, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing uh, our video. Now, Tiffany has 
been wonderful and she's actually here in the comments. So if you have any questions about the video, please go ahead and type them in the chat and she'll be responding to them there. Hi, my name is Tiffany Nestle and I work at the lab and I want to tell to you a little bit today about smell. Smell is such an underrated scent. It is actually really fascinating. Recently, scientists have decided that, um, or they've done the math and they figured out we might be capable of detecting almost one trillion distinct odors. Now, to put that in perspective, beforehand they thought maybe the number was about 10,000. So they have just realized we might be able to detect far more than we thought. And smell is actually our oldest sense. And the primary way that our ancestors interacted with the environment. We used our sense of smell to identify food, um, to figure out potential mates, I mean, hubba hubba, um, to uh, figure out any dangers, uh, foods or toxins, or any enemies. Humans have about 350 olfaction or smell genes compared to mice and dogs, which have over a thousand. But something really interesting is they've actually found evidence that we used to have over a thousand also, but because we now rely on our uh, sense of sight and vision more than our sense of smell, many of those have become inactive or what we call a pseudogene. And so though we rare, rarely rely on smell or we don't pay attention to it as much, our recall for smell is actually better than our recall for vision. So after three months, our vision recall accuracy drops to about 50%. Whereas for our smell recall, it's actually still at 65% one year later. Uh, so we rely heavily on smell. And one of the reasons that we think this is the case is because our olfactory bulb, which is the smell center in the brain, has a direct link to the amygdala and to the hippocampus. And that's why a smell can just instantly trigger a memory or get an intense emotion out. Uh, so one of the things that was fun was preparing for this talk. I went to the, uh, the exhibit, The Way We Played, at the Littleton Museum. Um, it has a bunch of toys from the last hundred years. It's just pretty fun. But one of the things they had was this aroma of play. And uh, they had these boxes. Now, don't be fooled by what you see in the boxes. When you open them, there was an odor. And that was a familiar smell from childhood. And what I found was with two or three of them, when I opened it, I was instantly transported back to childhood, being five or six years old and playing with my brother and sister, playing with my friends. And these are memories I had not thought about in years. They're not the ones that we reminisce about, but they were so vivid and so strong. Um, so I thought it would be kind of fun for us to do something similar here. It's a little harder over Zoom, but I think we can make it work. So I'm gonna go through a few uh, smells from my childhood. And what I want you to do is in the chat, throw in the ones that you resonate with, if it brought back to life some ideas for you. But if you didn't grow up where I did when I did, which was 80s and 90s in the suburbs of California, you may or may not relate to all of mine. So if you don't, throw in some smells that you do relate to and share, just share some of your vivid ones from childhood. Um, so something that was fun was across the board, there was one smell that seemed to bring back the most nostalgia for everyone. And that was the smell of crayons. Um, they've been around since like the 1920s. So generation wide, people can remember this smell. Um, and when I saw that, my mind instantly jumped to the Mr. Sketch scented markers. I don't know if you remember those but the cherry and the blueberry, those were my favorite ones. Um, and they were so strong. And that instantly brought to mind another memory, which was number two pencils and the uh, erasers that went with them, the new eraser smell. Uh, next, uh, a lot of things that dealt with our sense of play. Uh, so the rubber bouncy ball, and some of you might remember Kush balls. Uh, how about a new can of Play-Doh? And how about like blasting caps or cat guns and that kind of burning uh, smell. Although I'll say that has a sound remembering for me too. 
Uh, there are some things I don't have pictures of, but some other popular ones were Pokemon cards. Uh, those were a little after my time. Uh, boxes with new puzzles in them, uh, bubble tape, and uh, Dr. Pepper lip smackers. Now, most of what I've said so far are really pleasant memories, really fun ones, but there's also some really fragrant memories from being sick. How about the bubble gum amoxicillin or a Vicks Vapor Rub? Uh, and so, as I said before, a lot of these smells and the memories are rather cultural. And so, I didn't grow up on a farm. So, I don't find these smells particularly pleasant. But to a lot of kids who did grow up there, this is fresh air, this is work, this is home and comfort. So, for different people in different places, smells are going to evoke different memories and different, um, different emotions. And so, as powerful as emotions are, um, I'm sorry, as odors are, we're actually really terrible at identifying them by name. So one study showed that without training, people could only get um, guess household items by about 50% accuracy based on the odor. And I'm talking about things like peanut butter and coffee, everyday items. But what they found was that if we used a multiple choice card, and had that option on there, we did so much better. And what this means is that language actually might be one of our biggest challenges for processing or putting, um, thinking through smells and identifying them. It's not the smell itself, it's the words. And there's some really cool research around this. So it turns out that our sense of smell, um, or we have a very limited vocabulary for our sense of smell. And we have a tendency to describe a smell according to its source. So we'll refer to something as being lemony or floral, or sometimes, unfortunately, really skunky. But it turns out we don't actually do this with any of our other senses. For example, I don't say that something looks staplery. I describe it by its color, its shape, and some other attributes. So, um, if I ask you what is clear and rectangular, you don't instantly know what I'm thinking of. It could be ice, it could be uh, a window, or what I was actually thinking of was a fish tank or an aquarium. Uh, and it turns out with our other senses, we do the same thing. Uh, we do not group it by the origin, the origin, we give it other attributes. And there are actually a few people groups that can do this. They can go by attributes of a smell instead of the source. I'm going to put up a paraphrase of a quote by Asifa Majid, who has worked with the um, Shahai people in Malay. And I'm, I'm going to apologize now. I'm going to butcher a couple of the words, and I don't intend to. But uh, the Shahai people can describe smells as easily as we do colors. They have a set of 12 words to refer to different types of smells in the same way we have color groups like green, red, and blue. And in the same way we don't use a color to describe a taste or a texture, the words they have are unique to the smell. So hajet is the Jahai word for the common smell between like a tiger, a rubber tree sap, a burnt hair, lighter, um, lighter gas, just like red is the common color for a lot of objects in English. And so though we don't have a lot of words, we can actually um, get better at this. I'm gonna go for an example first though. Because smell um, in the olfactory bulb gets to our language center faster than many of the other uh, senses, what the information that gets there is often a little more crude and hasn't been um, processed yet. So a metaphor from Wired Magazine that I really liked was that smell information or olfaction information is like notes written on the back of a napkin. Whereas your audio and your visual information is like a polished manuscript. It's just far more refined by the time that it gets there. So while we don't really have the words most of the time right now, we actually can improve on this. Uh, there's something called smell training. And this was originally used for anosmics, which are people who uh, have lost their sense of smell. It's kind of their rehabilitation. And it requires them to sniff different things and really concentrate on them multiple times a day for several months. And while that doesn't sound very fun, 
what they found was they had great results. And they did the same thing with an older population. And they found that the group had improved uh, olfaction function, uh, verbal function, and just overall well-being improved. But what they found the most interesting was that the comparison group, the control group that they used, had um, they were given two Sudoku puzzles per day to, to finish. And the, the experimental group, the smell training group, actually outperformed them in each of those three areas. And Sudoku puzzles are sort of set forth as that pinnacle for how to keep your brain sharp. And yet the smell training tended to improve some of the areas even more, including overall well-being. So it's something to keep in mind. Spend a little bit of time paying attention to what's around you and really sniffing it and trying to put together words. And next time that you smell, stop and smell a rose, instead of saying, oh, that's a lovely rose, really think through some of the attributes and what other uh, things that you've got in common with it. So thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, notice how at the beginning of the poll, uh, we all of us had different associations with fog. So I had a lot of people um, associate the smell of rain with fall. Um, and that has to, a lot to do with your memories and smell association. So thank you so much to Tiffany for guiding us and informing us as to what a little bit of that scent science is. Um, I also wanted to, so I did just one, want to apologize for some tech issues. Uh, we're in the new Zoom world, it's happening. But I did just change our um, awesome settings to uh, so that everybody can see each other's chats. We have some amazing comments going on. So if you uh, change your two to all panelists and attendees, we can now see everybody's um, chat. I wanted to call one out in particular. Allison said that um, Allison works in the fragrance industry as a note. A big hurdle is communication about fragrance, oftentimes um, translating into memory moods and emotions that people communicate to notes um, in their palate. So when trying to say, I want this to smell like rain, they might say, I want this to smell like nostalgia, because that's something that I associate with it. So there's me interjecting a little bit of myself into that. Um, for our next segment, we do have I, something very similar to that, Allison. We have um, a segment on scent composition, which uses music as a metaphor to create a scent composition with perfumer and musician Shivalia Mwamba. Shivalia is a fascinating individual. Um, I will link a little bit of her information in that chat, but to give you all a quick um, overview, scent is often likened to that of, of a beautifully composed song. The words are the notes um, used and the ins instruments are the various individuals who enjoy wearing each song. We're excited to share an excerpt on the perfumer and musician, Shivalia Mwamba. She talks about her creative process and how she approaches fragrance um, creation from a musician's point of view. She was born a creative individual with a great imagination and a love for the outdoors, mainly because she could satiate all of her senses, particularly smell. She was raised around berry bushes, pine trees, and a pond. She was always surrounded by nature's perfume. Although an educator, her love of perfumery and fragrance began to crave her attention uh, for more pursuit. She found herself researching and reading about everything related to scent. This rekindled a passion and motivated her to want to speak with others about what she'd been reading. A few extra steps and she's actually creating her own fragrances. I will go ahead and link her Etsy um, shop in our chat. And I absolutely encourage everybody to take a look um, her story is a very, very powerful one and one that should leave the, the virtual setting. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And we're going to start her video. So I am a musician by trade as well as um, I'm classically trained as well as played by ear. So I have kind of a duality there. Um, so I would love to speak with you all about my creative process because I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about how I approach fragrance as a self-taught perfumer um, as a musician. So I think in terms of, of notes, there are a lot of vocabulary terms that I think could go for both music as well as fragrance. We have fragrance notes, we have um, accords, 
So I think in terms of creating a fragrance as um, building a song, if that makes sense, um, because I have the ability to play different styles of music, different genres of music. So when I create, I try to think, what do I want the beginning of the song to be? Or what do I want the, the initialization of the fragrance to be on the skin? or in the air if I'm creating a room spray. So I have a couple of vocabulary terms and I, I will talk slow so that I can explain them thoroughly. Um, there are three particular, actually four particular vocabulary terms that I will be discussing with you today to explain my creative process in, uh, in fragrance creation. First off, we have what's called sonata form. And some of you may have heard sonata form before. It's an older term and it basically is representative of types of music that was composed in um, classical, the classical musical period, all the way up to the 20th century. So there are three main movements in what's called sonata form. And they, once I, I talk about them, I'm sure you will be able to identify how it relates to fragrance. The first, um, vocabulary term or the initialization of fragrance creation for me is called the exposition. And in the exposition, you have, it's actually just the introduction of a piece. Um, the, it's the primary thematic introduction. So it's kind of subtle, just like top notes would be in, in fragrance creation. If you have citruses or your lighter notes, then the exposition would be the introduction of that fragrance. So just to kind of give you a sneak peek into um, how the fragrance might unfold to leave you on, on the edge of your seat per se. In the exposition or in the fragrance, you can have subdivisions. So say for example, I'm using, uh, let's see, I'm at my organ now, so I'm trying to see if I have some lemon, where is it? Yes. So let's just say that I'm starting with lemon. Well, I want it to be, or to have a little bit more depth but I still want it to be in the citrus category. So I would use lemon. I might use um, a little bit of lime, um, other forms of lemon from different, um, different areas of the world so that it's not just a linear type of scent. So that would be the exposition of the fragrance, the beginning of the fragrance, the top notes of the fragrance. And in the, as the, those top notes start to dissipate or start to transition, the next part of, of how I create my fragrances using scent as my, as my guide and using music as my guide would be the development. So in the development, just as it says, that means that the fragrance or that the song, because I'm using a duality here, the fragrance song or the scent music starts to play on the skin, tying in that exposition. So tying in the beginning notes, tying in the introduction, but now you have a little bit more depth. It's starting to develop into um, the heart of the fragrance, or if you're thinking in terms of music like I do, it would be the heartbeat or the middle of the song. And just the definition of development, remember we're talking about sonata form, so in the development, it plays on the exposition, so it's, it's starting to become a little bit more complex. So if we're thinking in terms of instruments per se, the, the exposition would be um, if you think of an orchestra, the exposition would be maybe the strings are coming in. Those are the top notes that come in on the skin and then you kind of smell the top notes. You're like, okay, I smell the lemon, I smell the lime. And then it develops into the heart of the fragrance or the heart of the song, which would be then you start to add in, if you have a choir or a soloist, they start to sing, not too loudly, but they just start to sing enough where you can hear them a little bit over the the orchestra that starts to play or the strings that start to play so but they're all coming in together in tandem or in in unity so to speak so the development also kind of takes you through several different conversations so if we have heart notes let's just say florals we don't want it to just be centered or i wouldn't want it to just be centered around a particular floral i would rather it be a combination or an accord of florals so that helps with my, my fragrance palette to develop that fragrance and develop the scent where you're going from the top notes to the middle notes or to the heartbeat of the song. And then the, the last um, vocabulary term, the musical term is actually called the recapitulation. And I know it sounds like a long term or a long vocabulary word. It just simply means now we're tying in the beginning of the song, beginning of the fragrance, 
to the middle of the fragrance. So you may still be able to smell those top notes. You may still be able to get um, some uh, nuances of the heartbeat, but now we're bringing the song or the fragrance to its conclusion. Not to say that it's going to end, but just to bring it to a conclusion where now we can feel the depth of the song. We can feel the depth of the fragrance on the skin. And then when we go back to smell it, we, we may not smell those top notes anymore, but we do definitely now have more of an understanding of, of what the perfumer, in this case myself, what I wanted to convey through those bass notes, through those lingering notes, oak moss, vetiver, um, musk, it just depends on, on the type of fragrance that I would be creating at that particular moment. So just to, to sum everything up before I go a little bit deeper, we have sonata form, which is a musical term that is talking about a theme, a type of theme, a musical theme that can be subdivided. We have the exposition, top notes, the development, the heart notes, and the recapitulation, which would be the bass notes. So when I'm creating, um, it depends on the type of inspiration that I have. Sometimes I actually phantom smell a scent before I actually sit down at my organ and try to, to start notating or start to write out the fragrance or write out the song, if you will, writing out the notes. Um, it depends, I'm, I'm inspired by many different things as I'm sure we all are as creatives. Um, I could be outside and phantom smell something or it could be just the thought that I'll have that reminds me of either a family member or a happy time in my life, or it could even be a solemn time. So I use that and translate that to how do I want this particular note to play in my song? And how do I want that song to translate on the skin? So I'm thinking in terms of a choir, a soloist, um, an a cappella piece, an orchestra, do I want it to be instrumental? Do I even want to have singers in this particular song? Do I want any particular note to stand out? And so I take all of those different factors into consideration as I'm creating. And then as I'm writing everything down, sometimes it changes. After I smell it on the skin or I beta test it on, on other people or even put it on my blotter, if I feel like one or more of the, the components are too loud or not loud enough, then I'll amp it up so that maybe the soloist needs to sing a little bit longer or the choir needs to back off just a little bit. So it's, it's definitely a musical process for me to, to create. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, as someone who's not very familiar with music, I think that is a beautiful way of looking at um, scent and scent composition. We had somebody in the chat earlier tell us about their experience being a nose um, in the scent industry. And I think uh, taking it from that to this like orchestraic way of viewing it is very date night, if I do say so myself. I also wanted to point out um, that uh, we want to first of all thank uh, Chevalia in advance because uh, that segment of uh, the talk that you just watched um, was prepared by the speaker uh, for the Experimental Scent Summit organized by the Institute of Art and Olfaction. And we were able to share that video to you under um, the Creative Commons attribution. If you would like to see our whole talk, I'm gonna go ahead and link that and the Institute of Olfaction into the chat. There you go. And again, her Etsy shop is really cool. If you want to experience those scents firsthand, that is a fantastic way of doing it and supporting um, a small business like that. Up next, we have some scent trivia. Now, before we start the scent trivia, I do have to tell you, I'm a fan of puns. Um, I'm going to try to let you know um, a few puns as we're going along. So we'll start right now. Now that we know about scent composition, do you know where scents are made? I'll give you all a few seconds to uh, put it in the chat, see if you all can think about it. Now that we know about scent composition, do you know where scents are made? Getting a few answers. The correct answer of oh, taste buds is, uh, Patrick is uh, giving us a, a very literal, no Patrick, it's the old factory, the old factory. But uh, I'm not here for the science, I'm here for the puns, ladies and gentlemen. 
but we do actually have some fun science trivia for you all. So I'm gonna go ahead and share um, our trivia with you all. And I'm going to, and I do have to apologize, again, having some Zoom tech issues today. So I'm not able to see the chat all the time, there they are. So welcome, tonight we will be doing uh, date night scent science trivia. What, the way that this is gonna work is that you're gonna see a question much like you're seeing it right now. And uh, there's gonna be, so for example, the question is, loss of smell is called one, anosmia, two, anemia, or three, apnea. And I'm going to ask you all to let me know in the chat what you think it is. We've got a few votes for one. I'll give you all a little more time. Overwhelmingly, and you all are correct, um, the loss of smell is indeed called anosmia, and uh, it's the main neurological symptom and one of the earliest and most commonly reported indicators of COVID-19. People can also be born without a sense of smell or lose their sense of smell due to a virus or head trauma. We do, uh, that is from the harvard.edu news article. So good job to everybody who guessed one. I don't think there was anybody who didn't guess one. So good job. Our next question for those playing, the Magawa, the rat, has been ha uh, hailed a hero for which of the following accomplishments? Is it one, being the cutest rat ever, two, detecting landmines, or three, identifying cancer by smell? Again, we're gonna give you all a little bit of time. We've got some votes for two, for two some votes for three. One, I think one is the right answer, Chloe Day, so I'm with you on that one. One and three, yes, they are not mutually exclusive. It can both be the cutest rat ever and be good at one of those two other things. Give it a few more seconds. I'll let you all argue with your dates. That's my favorite thing. Not actually, I love my partner, but I love being right as well. All right, so the answer is number two, detecting landmines. Well, there are animals who are trained um, to detect cancer. The Magawa, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, so I'm sorry, um, which is a Tanzanian-born African giant pouched rat, um, and it has been trained by the nonprofit Apopo to sniff out explosives. With careful training, he and his rat, um, he and his rat colleagues, <laughs> learn to identify landmines and alert their human handlers, so the mines can be safely removed. In four years. He has found 39 landmines, and therefore we can add to the list of things that other animals have accomplished that I have not. I have found zero landmines, my friends. So unfortunately, the Magawa is more accomplished in that field than I am. Our next question. True or false? A flower can smell like a dead body. For true, say one. For false, Day two. Getting a lot of answers. Whoop, I went back on that one. That's my fault, folks. Somebody said three. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and uh, Mark has the right answer right there. It is, in fact, true. Um, I have to keep moving my. Uh, chat back and forth, so excuse me. It is in fact true, so commonly known as the corpse, uh, the corpse flower, there you go, corpse flower, or Amorphophallus titanium. It is often described as having the smell of rotting meat. The odor is a mechanism for the plant to draw in pollinators. And yes, Mark was correct, the Denver Botanic Garden is home to the corpse flower, which bloomed in 2018, and is unfortunately not expected to bloom in 2020. And again, we're gonna, uh, unfortunately, fortunately, who really knows? Um, but that is a fun fact. So our next question. This stately magazine published a piece in 1930 titled Perfume and Politics. So 
got the famous perfumer, Francois Cody, who was both a perfumer and a politician, once called a gentleman of mystery. So the question is, which magazine was it? Give you all some time since it's more than just a numbered question. And look at that, we've got some right answers. Excellent. You are correct. It was indeed the New Yorker magazine. Uh, the noses, uh, whoop, that's not the, the thing for that. But yes, so in 1930, they published a piece um, about this really cool guy who apparently can do it all. Again, on a list of things that are people are far more accomplished, my, I'm currently just smelling my vanilla handle Yankee candle, and that's, that's all I got. <laughs> All right, our next question. What is the function of those little hairs in your nose? Does it one, act as a filter for dust, bacteria, etc., Or two, is it purely decorative? Yes, that is for folks who find nose hairs particularly attractive. Again, I'll give you all a little bit of time to guess this one. And you all are correct. It does indeed as, act as a filter um, for dust and bacteria. So the nose is lined with fine hair-like projections known as cilia. Together, cilia and snot collect dust, bacteria, and other debris um, so that they, don't, they can't enter the rest of the body. And I think that's really cool. A lot of people shave their nose here, so there we go. All right. Now this next question is absolutely my favorite. It's especially important for date night. Um, for anybody who is having a date night to get away from littles, this one will surely rile some folks up. Sometimes science suggests that you eat boogers. Is that true or false? Again, let us know in that chat. This is already dividing our chat. <laughs> Annalisa teaches preschool and believes that it's absolutely true. Give you all a little more time. I'm seeing less responses on this one. I'm wondering if uh, we're just scared to say it. <laughs> ah, all right. So the answer is true. Now, Fun fact, uh, my colleague Jessa helped put together these fun facts, and I had to go back and check the research on this one. Um, but it turns out that according to a study published um, in the Journal of American Society for Microbiology, snot may help the immune system fight back against infections. So uh, co-author Scott Knapper, who is a professor of biochemistry at the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, said, that nature pushes us to do different things because it's our, to our advantage to have certain behaviors, to consume different types of food. So maybe when you have the urge to pick your nose and eat it, you should just go with nature. And I will add to that, so apparently it's just because uh, all of that fun bacteria that lives in your nose that your little nose hairs catch um, help aid in building up your immune system. Uh, I don't particularly recommend you do that right now. <laughs> uh, Jessa said one, unless uh, you want date night to go well. Um, I don't particularly recommend that you do that, but in, um, I think it was like 2016, that scientist did. Wow, seemed to be dividing up the chat there. We got a lot of ones and twos. As somebody who has worked with children before, even if you can't do it, even if you don't endorse it, you cannot stop it. You can pick your friends, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friend's nose. So we have one more um, thing going on for you tonight, and I'm very excited for this one. We've talked a lot about, make, about smells and harmony, and the harmony that you make when you create a fragrance. We've talked a little bit about um, uh, a lot of things. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about some smelly science and what the nose knows. Tiffany took us on a fabulous journey about memories and scent. Well, now we're gonna take that um, a little further than Earth, a little further than where you're watching into space. 
and Naomi, our very own space scientist, is going to tell us about smells in space. Everybody knows that no one can hear you scream in space, but what about your other senses? Could you smell in space? Well, technically, yes, there could be some molecules that would have a scent if they went up your nose, but that would mean you've taken off your spacesuit during your next spacewalk, and that would be bad. We definitely don't recommend that. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about scents in space, because we do know what space smells like, and some of that comes from firsthand accounts from astronauts. Hi everyone, my name is Naomi Paquet, and I'm a space scientist and educator here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Did you know that space smells like burnt steak? Astronauts consistently report the same strange odor after lengthy spacewalks or when first docking with the ISS. They bring it back in on their suits and their tools. It's bitter, smoky, and slightly metallic. Kind of like a burnt steak meets a hot metal mixed with arc welding. So what causes that smell? One possible culprit are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Say that three times fast. They are organic compounds made only of carbon and hydrogen. On Earth, we find them in fossil fuels and in tar deposits. But they can also be found in high levels on meat cooked over an open flame, which explains that burnt steak smell. We find these molecules all over our solar system, and it's possible there are trace amounts of them out in space that could get stuck to spacesuits. These are caused by dying stars from long ago, left behind as remnants. Now, does this sound like a scent you just can't live without? Are you thinking about changing up your perfume or cologne for your next hot date? Don't worry, Kickstarter's got you covered. Just head on over to Kickstarter and you too can buy a bottle of Oda Space for you and a school. Now, originally this was developed to train astronauts, but this bottle of perfume is now available to the general public and to schools for educational purposes. Now, astronauts have described one other distinct scent, the scent of lunar regolith. Dust was a huge problem for the Apollo missions. It stuck to everything, and astronauts were constantly carrying it into the lunar lander on their suit. It turns out the moon, or at least the lunar regolith on the moon, smells like spent gunpowder. And if enough of you join that Kickstarter for Oda Space, they'll release Oda Moon, so you can introduce your date to another space smell on date two. But for the rest of space, we don't have firsthand accounts from astronauts of what it smells like. Instead, it's based on spectroscopy. You can think of spectroscopy as the science of rainbows. Like a prism breaks apart light into a rainbow, scientists can use a spectrometer to break apart light into distinct lines of color. These lines, called spectra, are fingerprints of elements, and they can allow us to determine what faraway planets, stars, and galaxies are made of. So now, we know that the atmosphere of Venus has a lot of sulfur dioxide in it, which would smell a lot like a freshly struck match. If you could survive the long journey into the lowest layer of Jupiter's atmosphere, you would smell bitter almonds thanks to that scent of deadly hydrogen cyanide. Now, thankfully, if we look beyond our own solar system out into our galaxy, we find much more pleasant scents. Take this giant molecular cloud, Sagittarius B2, located in the center of our Milky Way. This cloud of gas and dust would smell a lot like raspberries and rum. Sounds like a great cocktail for that hot date night. Now, we definitely don't recommend taking off your helmet during your next spacewalk, but the next time you burn a steak or just smell some raspberries, you can take a bit of space home with you. Thank you so much, Naomi. That was so fascinating. Let's see. Smells like Venus. <laughs> well, we have one more thing planned for you all today. And for this, I'm going to pull out more props, not because I'm comedically inclined, but because it's sugar. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my notes here because while I am a, a space communicator, I'm not a space scientist or a scientist. I am in the social sciences. So I'm going to rely on the fabulous resources that my very brilliant colleague said here. Let's give me just two seconds. There you go. 
So what I have here is technically not what's on the script. Um, I have a lollipop. Now I'm going to invite you all, if you have jelly beans, this activity works really, really well with jelly beans. If you don't and happen to pick up jelly beans later, you can do it at a later time, but really it works with almost anything. I know because I've tried it today with almost everything in my house. Taste and smell are just two of our five senses. Receptors on our tongue um, and soft palate or mouth can detect five tastes. That's sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, which no, for those of you watching at home is not a friend's reference. Um, it's savory. So think of grilled mushrooms and that's a great flavor. Flavor, on the other hand, is determined by the brain. So when we eat and we drink, the brain integrates information from all five of our senses, including smell, and it compares it to previous experiences to derive at a determination of flavor. So our experiment tonight, which again, I invite you to do with me, is to determine if you can identify a flavor if we don't use our sense of smell. Again, jelly beans work great for this activity, but if you don't have it, I have found that multi-flavored lollipop also work. Um, you can also use tea. I used it on my tea earlier, um, as well as almost anything. It's especially fun if your partner picks out, or if your date picks out what it is that you're trying out, um, or your roommate, or your what, whoever it is, or your dog, you can have them choose um, blindly, if you will. Um, now, obviously, our sense of sight will give us a lot of clues about what to expect, but try hard only to interpret what your tongue is tasting for this next part. All right. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna pinch our nose, and I'm not gonna do it quite yet so I don't sound nasally on camera, um, but you're gonna pinch your nose and put that object of food in your mouth. You'll take three to four good chews, or in my case, licks of the food in your mouth with your nose pinched um, while breathing through your mouth. Now, this is important. Be careful not to inhale your food. We do not endorse that. <laughs> um, now you can move that around in your mouth um, and contemplate what the flavor is before you swallow. See if you can guess what it is. So before you swallow, again, you're gonna release that pinched nose and take a deep breath in and see how it changes. I'm gonna do it really quick. And now again, ooh, that was powerful. <laughs> When your nose is pinched, uh, your brain is receiving information from all of your senses, except your sense of smell. For example, your mouth says, hey, this is sweet, but your can't, tongue can't really tell what flavor it is. It's a cherry, orange, something else. Now again, sight um, helps you quite a bit there because the color can give your brain a clue. You might say that wasn't cherry, that wasn't orange because the jelly bean was not that color. For me, I knew that my lollipop was pink, but I have like five different flavors of pink lollipop. And what I experienced personally was, um, could definitely taste that sugar smell, but even afterwards as I was taking it out and really just hit me all together, that was definitely strawberry. <laughs> Let me know in the chat if you were able to try it. But it's a fun little experiment um, because it takes your nose detecting the smell to help your brain identify that flavor. Now that can happen through, um, in two ways, orthonasal, when the scent of the food comes into your nose before you eat it, or retronasal, when the um, scent enters your nasal cavity from the back of your mouth. So when your nose and your mouth both send messages to your brain along with the message from your other senses, your brain puts together um, that information and it matches it to past experiences to tell you, hey, you're eating an apple. Or in my case, hey, you're eating a strawberry lollipop and your dentist is gonna be very mad at you for that. Um, so what we did by blocking that was preventing your brain from receiving that smell data. So we'd have to rely on other clues and just that taste stuff. So it's a fun little experiment to try at home. Um, we definitely just did the retro nasal by unplugging our nose after the fact. But I've had a lot of fun tonight. Thank you all for joining us amidst a few technical Zoom difficulties. They're bound to happen. Um, thank you to everybody who helped us out. I believe we still have Patrick and Tiffany here. Um, if you all have any questions for them. Patrick, if you're online, I did see a question for you earlier. And I'll wait for confirmation. Um, but if not, that's okay. We really appreciated everybody being here today. We hope that you all had fun and we hope that you will join us for our next two date nights. 
Um, because it is spooky season, our next one coming up is supernaturally themed. So uh, very excited to have Dr. Aaron Baxter, I believe, um, for that one. And the one after that is Reality Bites. So hope you all join us again. This is a lot of fun. We will see you all at our next date night. Thank you. Having all of the Zoom issues today. Thank you all. It's my pleasure. It was really fun. It's always, it's always a pleasure to watch these. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. And Patrick, while you're still on for a, a few of our folks that are still here, does mold wine keep well for the next day, or should you drink it right away? Yeah, I uh, I wrote uh, make sure it's strained. <clears throat> and um, yeah, it, it it actually makes a great gift in the uh, in the in the season. Fantastic. Well, thank you all again. We will see you all next time.